golf and outings future is of course a mystery but reader dear what you see here is largely history It was in 1897 that such loyal and sturdy Scots as McMurrick, Wenley, Cushney and Craig began going out into the country near Ann Arbor with those queer-looking bags filled with broom handles hung over their backs. They used to go out and play golf on uh, part of what became the Michigan Golf Course out near the tennis building. And they have got other people interested, so there was a very informal organization. They decided to form a club. Dear Sir, you are invited to be present at my home Tuesday at 8 p.m for the purpose of discussing the formation of a town and gown golf club. Yours truly, Junius E. Beal, September 25th, 1899. And these are the minutes of the first meeting in 1899. Four years later, in 1903, this leased land was purchased and a new club, the Ann Arbor Golf and Outing Club, was incorporated. Where did the word outing come from? In the Articles of Incorporation, it said, third, the purpose of this organization is to provide social intercourse among its members and to provide for them the convenience of a clubhouse and grounds whereon outdoor sports games and pastimes may be enjoyed, period. No mention of golf. The purpose wasn't just golf, it was to have things like outings, picnics, things like that. And that's what they did. At the time that this happened, there really were no automobiles. This is 1900. And it was a little ways to come from the campus or the town. There was no ready access to this club. Ann Arbor Saline Road, Main Street, uh, did exist. It was called a plank road. It was a toll road. But that was not too easy to get to because it's a long hill. The other way out is on State Street from the campus but there's quite a ways from state to here, and there was no road. People who wanted to play golf walked out here, or maybe rode a horse or something like that, and carried their clubs. Thomas C. Trueblood was a founding member of the Ann Arbor Golf and Outing Club and the father of Big Ten Golf. He tells of the club's beginnings. The southeast 10 acres was in growing corn. The rest of the course was in pasture land. A flock of sheep was pastured there a year or two to do the mowing, and when the greens were constructed, Wires were strung about them to keep the animals from disturbing the putting surface. A small, square, two-story house stood a few paces east of the ninth green. This was used as a clubhouse. You know, the history of the club, there are a couple of things that people always ask about. One is the date, 1890. Back sometime around the late 40s, an original member, Trueblood, wrote a one-page history, and he started out by saying, around 1890, two Scotsmen came to teach at the university and started playing golf. Well, this was you know, 50 or 60 years since that had happened, and he was a little bit off on his time because the two Scotsmen didn't come to the university until around 1895. Golf was never played in the United States until around 1888 or 1889. That would have meant this would have been one of the first golf courses in the United States, and that, that wasn't true. The 1890 date is incorrect. But I guess if you tell a lie big enough and long enough, people believe it. Very likely that an initial group of people playing golf in Ann Arbor started before Washtenaw. In that little book there, they mention Washtenaw because at that time Washtenaw was already incorporated. So therefore, officially, Washtenaw is older. 
but unofficially, probably golf and outing is older. Originally, Yost wanted to put the stadium here. It was ideal for it because when they built the stadium, there was a very active spring water underneath it, and uh, there's still stories about how there's still a steamroller buried under the football field. I don't know if it's true or not, but because they did have a lot of trouble with it caving in like the Panama Canal did while they were building. Yost said, well, we guess we can't do that because there are a lot of professors that play over there. He knew that it would be a big political deal. U of M would love to get that triangle back. Canham tried several times to work out a deal where they would trade some property. The university couldn't do that. They couldn't trade their property. And Canham used to complain about the way it was used. Mainly because people were selling stuff. So we spruced it up a little bit and made it look a little better. Tennis, from what I can find out, has been played pretty much since day one. The tennis complex is made up of two courts, including a house that originated as a maintenance shed. Hey, we've come a long way, baby, in our facilities. The original shed is now Angel Tennis House, named after one of the first and most active tennis promoters, Bob Angel. One of the tennis families from here was the Devine family. We had John Devine and Edmund Devine. John Devine got the idea that we should always start serving in that corner of that court. It's easier to keep track of who's supposed to be where. It probably will end up in the international rules. It'll be the divine rule for serving in tennis. As time creeps up on tennis players, they tend to take the easy way out and they turn to golf. That's one of the things that really amazed me is that how close this golf course is today as it was a hundred years ago. Very few real changes have been made with the exception that the sequence of holes were changed. Real yardage is pretty close, everything. So number three, our current number three was number one. It used to be that the tee for number seven was behind number six green. So number seven was quite a bit longer and it was much more difficult. Also, of course, if you were on the, the tee, it became a little dangerous. If there is a tougher par four hole than number six, so be it. Should one arise, let me advise. I never want to see it. At various times, I've tried to change the course. They brought a die and newcombs in to, to look at it, and they were never able to figure out how to make a par five. We used to have a lovely creek, quite pretty. There's no doubt of it. Its beauty died, though, when one tried to play one's golf ball out of it. And the creek ran between number one green and number seven green. It ran along until it got into, in front of number three T, and then emptied into the university. And somewhere in the 1950s, there was a golf course across the street. When it rained and so forth, the water would simply go into the ground. So what happened is when they built a high school and they paved a lot, they effectively blocked off the uh, ground from water. The uh, water started running off and ran down this creek and the creek became uh, a small river. There were wild times. I remember being here for dinner on one occasion at least after some heavy rains and the, the, there was a roaring torrent coming through that depression. The end result was that the 
it wasn't the fault of the golf course that this had happened. It was a fault of building that school. The city paid to enclose the creek. And so there's culverts going across here, and that's why you don't see the creek anymore. But it still exists. That's why we have that fountain over there at the university. Get across the creek five times yes. at that time. Yeah. A lot of people's balls would go in the creek, and everybody would be hunting for their balls in the water, and it held up the game so much that Johnny Malloy decided to institute this policy. He had a big basket up in the shed that was attached to it this little clubhouse. If you were told not to be hunting for your ball, it would be picked up by somebody else and put in this basket. And usually it was, so you'd see people in there hunting around in that basket for their balls before they start out. Johnny Malloy was, of course, the inspiration for this club and really the guy that held it together and made it better known. Johnny started out as a caddy here, but then he got a job. One of the things he'd have to do was go around to all the holes and, and they used to have, used to have a pail of water and a and a mound of sand there, and then he would make the teas out of the water and sand. But, you know, he lived over here in the corner of Snyder in South Main, and we always guessed that he could go out in his front lawn and hit a ball and drive it to the first tee here, and he could. He had the state championship three years, 27, 28, 29. And Drew People was one of the best golfers in the state. In 1999, we formed a committee and decided that the whole clubhouse needed attention. We put more square footage in and we put more windows in to brighten it up. We hired an architect and we tried to keep the concept and not change the building because it's over 100 years old. So we literally tore down the porch and tore down the Johnny Malloy lounge, which in the old days was the pro shop. The membership of this club did not demand any embellishments. They um, they kept it simple all through these years, and uh, I think that's been the charm of the club. else is there a golf club that flouts grammar quite so merrily as one that hangs a sign to warn all cars to egress warily.